So, welcome to the second part of the lecture. Uh, in this part, we're going to talk about HPC applications in neurosciences. But before we get there, uh, let's do a quick refresher of what we talked about in part one. So in part one, we talked about applications in healthcare. And part of these applications are applications of uh, uh, in, in respiratory disease, as we already saw with ARDS and the Smith project. We also talked about the applications in uh, fighting COVID-19, which are the COVID net, it's a convolutional neural network, and um, how these applications also are uh, using HPC resources to complete the goals that they set out to, to reach. So uh, again, we saw that convolutional neural networks are being applied in these applications, as well as recurrent neural networks, which are the uh, networks that take into consideration the history or like the past values of the data itself, as well as, as the current values in order to either predict future values or give a prediction of outcome from these values. So uh, from this part, we move on to the talking about HPC, uh, HPC in neurosciences. And to begin this part, we're going to watch a short video made uh, at the announcement of the Big Brain Project. So we're going to leave the presentation for a second. For you, it's, it, it is available as part of the presentation and you can play it directly through, but I'm going to move out of the presentation to be able to show the video more efficiently. Hello, my name is Alan Evans. I am the scientific director for McGill's Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives Initiative, or HBHL, funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, or CFREF. This is an exciting time for brain research as we witness the impact of the information revolution in neuroscience. Applications of big data analytics, artificial intelligence in neuroscience are everywhere. Montreal has long been a world capital for brain research and has now become arguably the global center of gravity for deep learning. Major CFREF funding to McGill and the University de Montréal in these areas has brought in a whole new generation of data scientists to work at the interface between these two fields. The Jurisch Forschungszentrum in Germany is one of the largest research centers in the world and hosts a huge community of researchers in many fields, including supercomputing and neuroscience. Katrin Amon's team at Ulish and my team at McGill have been working together for over 20 years, most notably on the Big Brain Project to create the highest 3D resolution digital brain atlas so far created, equivalent in size to 125,000 MRI volumes. With support from the Helmholtz Association McGill's Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives initiative and the Ulish Forschung Centrum, we are delighted to take the next step in this journey by inaugurating the Helmholtz International Laboratory, HIBOL, here at the Montreal Neurological Institute, now known as the Neuro. HIBOL will bring together experts in clinical and basic neuroscience, artificial intelligence, image processing, and computational modeling to explore the brain using in silico simulation of brain network organization. HIBOL will provide a unique international research and training environment for the bright young stars of tomorrow. As co-director of HIBOL with Katrin, it is a pleasure to officially inaugurate the HIBOL laboratory. I cannot wait to get started on the science. Okay. So back to the presentation. So as you could as you could see in the video, uh, a lot of this work that has do, has been done for the Big Brain project was actually taking parts of a brain and then slicing them, micron thickness slices, and then scanning them and introducing them into a computer where it was reconstructed into these images that you can see here. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll also link the page where you can go into the atlas and uh, slide through the brain in three different directions. And it's really cool to see this, this application, but it's also really interesting to think about the background of this application, because these slices, when, when specific light is being directed at them, allow scientists to be able to detect 
in which direction the neurons are going. And that way they can uh, infer the uh, connections within the brain. And this can't be done specifically by a person because it would take too much time. Too many scientists can't be working on this at the same time because it will take up too much time and it will take up too much effort. So instead, the applications that you saw last uh, in the last session with, uh, with Rocco, where uh, I'm, I think he talked about the uh, edge detection in these hyperspectral images, can also be applied in brain applications. Uh, a similar work also has been done by uh, uh, Professor Lotta Maria Ellingsen. She's uh, at the University of Iceland as well. And she, her project was on the detection of uh, fluid buildup in the brain, but it specifically worked on edge detection within the brain images. So you can see a lot of these applications of AI and uh, computational uh, uh, image processing for the brain. And in this part, we're going to talk about this. But specifically, I want you to keep in mind that this image that you have of neuroscience, this looking at the brain, is only one part of the work that's being done in neuroscience. Because before you even think about having these images, there's also a lot of work that needs to be done before we even get to these images. So in this part, we're going to talk about exactly that. And we'll start at this point here. So the um, HPC design, or artificial intelligence in HPC design was developed with six pillars in mind. And these six pillars are presented here on the left side. From these six pillars, specifically neuroscience was highlighted as one of the applications that this can be used. And uh, this core concept is why we are giving it like a lot of uh, light at this point. But also there's applications in high energy physics, as you can see in the, um, a lot of news about CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. There's earth science as Rocco mentioned last week, last session. There's space weather applications. And recently uh, there was in the news that uh, the European Space Agency and NASA are looking for applicants who will work in space weather prediction molecular dynamics and systems biology or protein folding is also a major aspect of uh, uh, HPC. And also it's a major aspect of uh, HTC, as you probably have seen in the course as well, because at some point a, a game was developed where people could do protein folding at home. And that is one of the applications of HTC as you've already seen, which is uh, doing normal up, uh, normal small operations on normal machines and then bringing it together around the world. Our application will be neuroscience, but there's also radio astronomy, which is detection of radio waves from space in order to construct images of spatial features. So neuroscience specifically is the application is the application that we're going to talk about, but not just the applications in neuroscience, but rather, the how to build a platform for neuroscience. And this is how to do it. Now, we are going to go through these um, layers of the, uh, of the platform throughout this part of the presentation. And uh, it might look complicated at first, but in effect, it's, um, I'm not going to say quite simple. It's um, every part of it, is an integral part of the whole process. It can't exist without every part of it. And at the same time, every part is uh, equally important. So what we've already seen in the first part, which is COVID-19 chest X-ray analysis and the ARDS time series analysis, they are only the surface of what kind of work is being done here. And also is the neuroscience and big brain research which is the part, which is why I started this part of the presentation by saying that this is nice to think that this is all of the work that's being done, but in the reality, this is only the surface and there's a lot of things happening in the background. And why are these things important? And why is it important to mention that this is only the surface? It's because 
some people get into this and they think that this is not cool work that I'm doing. It feels so, uh, I mean, we don't go into this for the beauty of the work. We also go into building something that will benefit everyone in the end. So in, before we can even think about analyzing the brain and the connections within the brain, we have to think about how we're going to do that. So the first step of building the, uh, there are several steps to doing this. And the first step is definitely not analyzing the data. The first step, the last step is analyzing the data. Before analyzing the data, before using HPC for neuroscience applications, we have to set up the infrastructure for data storage. Where should we store this data? How do we have access to it? How do we process it? But before even thinking about storage and computing, we have to think about how we're going to share this data because some of this data is stored in secure sense, is secure uh, servers. Some of it is in um, offline servers. Some of it is on physical media. How do we get it from the place that it is to the place that we need to put it in to process it? But also some of the processing on these images uh, requires to be done before the data is processed. And how do we take care that this versioning, as we mentioned here, this versioning of the data itself is being done? Who controls it? So all of this needs to be done. But e even before doing this, we have to think if we have the proper software on the clusters that we're using this for. Do we have the proper modules? Do we have um, the proper implementation of, let's say, Python or um, uh, TensorFlow for image processing or uh, these, like the proper software to access the images that is being stored? Maybe it's in a codec that it doesn't understand. But first and foremost, before we think about anything in terms of software or applications or data, what we have to think about is if we have adequate resources for this. Do we have the adequate storage for it? Do we have uh, proper communication between the storage and the computing? Do we have the computing power to do it? So all of this has to be done first. So this data science platform comes together first by setting up the hardware but you set up the hardware with the end goal in mind. You set up your hardware and your connections thinking ahead about what you're going to use it for. So that's why a lot of these applications, for example, as we saw in the deep cluster, you had 390 gigabytes of RAM for each GPU because this, uh, this cluster was developed with image processing, multispectral image processing in mind. And at the same time, you also have CPU because the CPUs are going to mediate the communication of the data between the cluster and the storage. All of this has to be done at first and it takes years of planning, but when that's done properly, it will save you years and billions of euros in terms of hardware and like planning and uh, potential updates and additions to that cluster. So first you set up the hardware, then you think about the software that you need on it, and then you think about the communication protocols, and finally you start with the processing. And some in this part we're going to talk about some of the packages that are part of the data versioning, we're going to talk about some of the software being used. One of the major ones being used is Docker containers. So container management is a major part of running applications on a cluster. Um, containers, you might have already had experience with uh, virtual machines. Containers technically are similar, but in application, they are completely different. And we'll get to that in the next slide, but at this point, we're going to introduce Docker, for example, as a container management tool. So Docker enables a software to be ready to run within the cluster. It doesn't require an operating system. It's, a, it's an image that can be taken as it is and placed wherever you want to place it and it immediately runs. It has all of the source code and runtime and system, system tools and libraries 
already built in inside it. It is flexible and portable. And as I said before, it can run on almost every implementation. The core idea is to provide a software container that has all of the required software elements, and it guarantees that the application that you're trying to run will run without any problem. And this is a perfect thing for the clusters that you have when you're kind of working in this field, because at least you know that wherever you go, you just unzip whatever it is and it works. Uh, it, it helps you because a lot of the clusters are different in terms of their implementation, but at the core, they all run similarly. So what Docker does or any container management tool, what they do is that they communicate with all of these parts of the cluster that are different, but they run a similar system. And at least it gives you an environment that you are comfortable working in wherever you go. So it allows easier migration for applications from one cloud to another, or from one server to another, or from one cluster to another. And it also offers easy um, uh, implementations on the cloud. If you ever don't have access to the clusters that you need, the cloud is a very viable resource. For example, Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. All of these are applications where you can run HPC applications. Uh, eventually you'll, you'll get to know that, hopefully with the course, uh, with Morris's course on big data and uh, cloud computing. Um, so these applications, when, when you don't have access to HPC, you have some kind of pay per use applications on HPC, but it's uh, more, it's less proprietary. It's something available through the cloud. So when you have this kind of access, or if you lose that access and you gain access somewhere else, you need this kind of portability of your software. And this is what Docker provides. As we can see here on the bottom left, this is the structure of a Docker container. It's, um, it's firstly a physical server and an operating system running on it. And this is your cluster. And then the Docker engine runs on top of that. And within the, the Docker engine, you have three separate apps that use their own bins and libraries. But these apps are separate from one another and they run independently and they can run normally. In this slide, we see the difference between a Docker container, which is this part here, and a virtualization or a virtual machine. So for a, like we just mentioned what a, how a Docker engine is just running the apps directly. Whereas for a virtual machine, you have the hypervisor, which is the, the object controlling the virtual machine itself. And each virtual machine has to install a guest OS. And this guest OS will then have its applications and bins and libraries. So you have a large, of, a large overhead, which is storage that you have to put for the guest OS. This is something that Docker or other container management tools these are, this is what they offer, which is that there is no overhead. And this is something that at some point, when you realize that you're paying money and uh, like very good money for this storage, this is something at least it will save you a lot of money. So virtualization, as I mentioned before, it includes the applications, binaries and libraries, but it also includes an entire operating system. And that's, um, I mean, if we're going to think about the most basic application of Linux, the most basic implementation kind of takes up 15 gigabytes of memory. Um, that's not something that you're really at ease using or for technically nothing at this point. Whereas containers kind of over bypass all of this and just runs the specific software that it needs to run the specific software that you have. So that saves you a lot of, uh, it, it's called vendor independence, and it saves you a lot of space, it saves you a lot of memory, and it saves you a lot of, let's just admit it, money. The next part of, uh, of this presentation, we're going to talk about also um, software and data versioning. So uh, if you guys have already had some experience with programming courses and everything, I think you've already had experience with GitLab or 
GitHub, which are um, software versioning applications. So uh, for, for those who don't know, GitHub or GitLab offer uh, users the, the possibility of uh, uploading their code or maybe not uploading it, but synchronizing it with a server. And that way, if they do changes to that code, they can uh, save these changes. And if something's wrong with that code, they can roll back to a previous version without having that previous version on their own computers. Because GitLab and GitHub, their protocols save the changes and not the data itself. So with that in mind, DataLad, specifically an application that we are using, has this kind of application, but for the data itself, not for the software. Of course, you're going to use software versioning, but data versioning is something also that's interesting in our applications. For example, let's say you have these um, multispectral images of the brain and you do some kind of um, changes to them, for example, cropping using this part for this kind of application. Eventually, you do these changes, but you can't do it, you can't have your data, the, the initial data, and then the data that you did changes to in parallel, and then changes to other data also stored on the same cluster. That way, you'll have a lot of um, dead space that you can't use for anything because it's being used to store that data. Again, we have to think about using that space efficiently. And if you're not using it efficiently, you are losing money. And if it's not your money that you're losing, you're using someone else's money. So what DataLad does is allow you to do versioning on this data. That way you save the space and you also don't lose functionality. You have access to all of these changes to the data without, um, without the overhead, which is the loss of storage. So it has a built-in, uh, so as it says here, it has built-in support for metadata extraction and search. Uh, it, it doesn't consume much data. It offers direct access to individual files. It allows you to publish data, but sometimes that's probably not a good idea. I mean, it depends on your applications. It allows uh, reproducibility and it operates a crawler that regularly index your data sets for scientific data portals. So DataLad is built with on the same protocols that run Git or other Git versioning tools. It has version controlling for large content and it allows for transport mechanisms for sharing and obtaining the data. This is also uh, like data, data lab is something that you can also apply using uh, your code itself, which is in this case, in this case, you, you are applying it in Python. And uh, it also uses command line applications. So it is a very um, versatile tool that you can immediately apply to your data within the applications that you need it for. So, I mean, everything that will make your life easier, you have to get, you have to use it. And uh, this is something specifically that we're using in our project. So we already saw this image, the description of the platform itself. And here in these round, uh, in the circled parts, these are the parts where we're using DataLad, for example, where we're using applications of container management, uh, places where you, we're using machine learning libraries and places where we get the data sets themselves. So this all comes together on the platform itself at these points. And as you can see, all of the things that we talked about, none of them are in the top layers. They're in the integral part of the project itself. So for example, data lab and container management are done at this point, sorry, are done at this point here where the computing resources are being used, but they're also done at uh, loading the technology and li technology libraries and packages. For example, GitHub would be used in this case if you have some of your proprietary code that you have to apply in, the, in, in your applications, but also data lab could be used 
with initial access to the data. Similarly, uh, Docker containers can be used at the level of computing resources because that's where you will be running your data management skills or your data applications or your data processing. Um, the COVID net or the chest, uh, chest X-ray analysis or the ARDS analysis are done at the level of the libraries being loaded and between the libraries being loaded and the data being processed. All of these are great applications and you can see that again, the top layer is probably the least important part. Actually looking at the image of the, of the brain is the end result of years and years of research and a lot of people collaborating. And every part of the, every part of this, every layer of this application is just as or even more important than the end product. Because eventually, even if the output is not successful, even if every part of the uh, top layer is not successful, at least you have this built platform that uses all of these efficient methods of communication, data storage, data communication can be applied or just adapted to any other application. And this is the best thing, I think, the best thing about using HPC in these applications, because you start thinking instead of just like, I build this for one end goal, you build it for an end goal, but you also have such a deep understanding of how it works that you can easily adapt it to any other application. And with that, we come to the end, but before we conclude everything that we talked about, we, uh, I will link you to the Big Brain project and I'll go to it right now. But this is the place where you can actually go and browse the Atlas and kind of um, fly through the brain and see these slices in 3D. And if we go there now, this is the Atlas viewer. And as I move this, you can see on the bottom right side, which slice of the brain is being used. And you can see in the top left side, how in the transverse plane, it's being, it's changing. If I move the transverse part to look at a different part of the brain, you can see if, um, I don't know if you already know parts about the brain itself, but this part here, this would be the motor cortex, if I remember correctly. And this is an incredible tool because this is the part that controls most of the motor functions. And it would be interesting to see how these neurons are connected because these are the neurons that leave the brain and go directly through the spinal cord into every part of your body. So it would be interesting to see how they connect communicate one to, one to another, and then directly to the other parts of the body. Um, so hopefully you can see from this part, but also from all of the parts that we talked about before, how important this kind of work is. I mean, it's, of course, it's interesting to look at the brain, but it's also interesting to see how a lot of brains come together to be able to build this kind of platform. And with that, we come to the end of our presentation. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you found it uh, uh, interesting, but also inspirational to do your own kind of work in this field. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get to hear about all of your achievements uh, as you go on through your education. And maybe uh, someday you'll teach me something as well. So with that, I leave the floor to Morris, probably to conclude. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Shadi. Excellent presentation, the first part and the second part. A good motivation for the students at the end. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say also Shadi is a very helpful PhD student, also helping his you know, co-PhD students and also the master student he mentioned. So I think one of the good things is you see personality improvement of many of these PhD students. And he has a very good example of Shadi. Um, good. So I think that's it for essentially today. Um, we will continue with the domain of computational fluid dynamics with lecture 12 the next time.
So see you then and bye-bye.